Today is, um, is September 10th, uh, the year uh, 2004. We're at the Bridgewater Raritan football field, specifically the field house, and I'm interviewing Mr. Albert Senna, uh, who was in the Army Air Corps at the start of World War II and throughout, throughout World War II, and he was a participant in the baton, so-called Baton Death March. Um, Albert, thank you for talking to us today. Uh, Albert, to just start off, Start telling your story about your arrival in the Philippines and then the arrival of the Japanese, your experiences, and then moving to the death march. Okay. No, I arrived in the Philippines in October of 1941. And in 1942, in April, is when the General King surrendered Bataan and started on a death march. The death march was 65 miles and we didn't get any food or water. We started out with about 9,000 and when they got in the camp, the first camp, Camp O'Donnell, 10 days later they only had 6,000. Now on the march, of course, without water or food, a lot of them would drop dead. Of course for me, I, when I was so weak, I'd just come off the front line. I only had a canteen and, and a mess kit. And of course, for me, there's a Filipino with no legs trying to make the march. He didn't get too far. And uh, another fellow from my outfit, he dropped down fast. The truck ran over him. And the Japanese would uh, bayonet guys if they fell to the ground. And they were wild with trucks. If you got close to them, they'd just hit you with a bayonet. So, and then there was quite a few of them that jumped over bridges. And, and without the water, a lot of them were eating sewer water, so when we got into Camp O'Donnell, the first game, most of us had diarrhea, dysentery. I had it so bad, I wound up in a zero ward. We were maybe one out of a hundred got out alive. I was so weak, I didn't even sleep in the barracks. I slept next to the latrine. And it's a good thing I did because they were burying about a hundred of dead, so they figured they are going to die anyway. They, they took them out, some of them were alive even. They just clubbed them over the head and buried them. Filipinos took a bigger loss. They were losing about two or three hundred a day. So, I only stood there, oh, maybe about, maybe a month and decided to move a new camp kind of on. So, they asked me, uh, could I walk to the car? I practically crawled there and they threw me in the car, take me over to Cabana Tuan. So I get over there, that's no better, no water. They, they would put the water on for an hour and then they'd shut it off, you'd have a long line. And then I, I ran into, I was in the zero ward there and these fellows were all dying of diarrhea, malaria. And Dr. Bloom from New York come over. He says, could you walk over to mine? And he was right across, he was close to the morgue. He figured, well, if you die, you know, he could, no problem. I get over there, I wind up, he says, I got diphtheria. He was an ear, nose, and throat doctor. So I wound up in diphtheria ward. He said, I'm in diphtheria ward, no medicine, no medication. Everybody's dying. So at that time, they would line you up in groups of 10 if one uh, escaped to shoot the other nine. So one, one night, one of the fellows that was in bad shape used to uh, choking to death and had a pond there, magnets, he would dip his basket in, drink it. So one day he tried to, he climbed over the fence, but he got in the main, the main uh, area, they caught him, so we got safe, we thought for sure we were gonna get shot. Uh, I finally got out of the uh, diphtheria ward, I was one of the few, according to Dr. Bloom, I was one of the few that got out alive. Then I wound up in a blind ward, I got in a blind ward, I get another <laughs> barracks where there was one guy escaped and I thought for sure me coming they knew they were gonna pick me, but they already picked the they already had him picked, so they took the nine other guys, they had to go out and dig their graves and then they brought them back and shot them. And uh, then I got back on active duty, I was working on a f airfield, Los Penas Airfield. And uh, I worked there until the, our forces start moving in. On my birthday, September 30th, they bombed the airfield. And October the 1st, I wind up on a ship bound for Japan. And everybody was hollering for water. 
and uh, we lost quite a few on there that ship. I, I got hit once and finally got over to Formosa and got forced out of Formosa. I wound up in Japan in 1945. By that time I was in real bad shape and I was working planting rice but I just I couldn't. I was too weak and uh, next thing I knew I, I was falling down. I was going off so much there that when I got in the camp there they called my name out and beat me up for holding up the detail. This was August the 14th and uh, next thing I knew the 15th I didn't have to go to work. The war was over. So one of the officers, two officers come into camp, one of them was one I worked for as a surveyor, and I was followed by the name of Captain Johnson. So when he saw them, I says, he says, the war's over. So I worked for them until the, uh, till I got on the ship. A fellow by the name of Leon Jarowski was commander. He was, and uh, so he come down and see me and he wired my folks that I was alive. He was the prosecutor when I got back over in Somerville. So I, when I come back, I spent 14 months over in a hospital in Valley Forge VA Hospital. I so I was blind. But uh, when my folks come to see me, at least I was a one, one piece, I was glad. There was a fellow from Plainfield, he lost both legs, both eyes. And all of them were either lost arms or legs, so I was glad that I was a one piece. Internally, I was in bad shape, but uh, externally, I, was, I looked pretty good. He was so light, I used to take him out to dinner, because some of these rich people in Valley Forge would take us out in the evening, pick him up like a baby. He was like a half a man. His wife was only 22. She'd come up and take us home over the weekend. She'd drop me off in Bound Brook, and then they'd go down in Plainfield. But uh, all in all, uh, and uh, since then, I, I had a good life. I was married 55 years, had a good married life. Very active, I was national commander from 50, 52. National Truman. commander of what? A, national commander of what organization? Please? Of the fellows on Botanic Regidor. And how did you get to be national <coughs> commander? I was elected, mm -hmm. elected during the convention. Mm -hmm. And I served two terms, actually, and part of another one, because the original guy got in an automobile accident, called from Boston in June, so I had to take over for his nine months, plus I served two, two terms. And you, so said, you said you met President Truman? Yes, As President Truman was president at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have quite a few letters from President Truman. Uh, I appeared before the... Uh, Congressional Committee on the Inhuman and Forced Labor Business, which was passed by Congress and passed by Harry Truman. I should have asked him for the pen. <laughs> he probably would have given it to me because I had a couple of letters, I had about six, seven letters from Truman. Personal letters to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, he was, he answered letters no problem with Truman. In fact, we had a convention in, in Kansas City and we went over to see his home. Of course, Truman didn't have any pensions, you know. It wasn't until after him that they passed a pension bill. In other words, they send out letters. <laughs> he had to go to the bank and borrow some money, I guess. But he only had one guard there. He come over, but I, I told my name, but don't tell, don't tell the president, because, I mean, he's ill. I don't want to go see him, and he would have probably invited me in. But his house was run down, a fence needed painting. The following year, of course, he passed away, and we had a convention there, and we had about three or four busloads to go over. Pay Truman at his grave, we planted a, a, a wreath over there. But Truman was very friendly. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to yeah. when you're. Let's go back to when you're first on the Philippines. Do we yeah. have about what time? Six. We time six. We leave at six fifteen. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's go back to when you were on the Philippines right. and the Japanese attack. Right. Where were you on the, in the Philippines, and what did you do? What was your uh, role? I was working on an airfield. I was, uh, I was a surveyor. Mm -hmm. There was three of us from New Jersey. We just had laid out an airfield on Del Carmen, and the 34th pursuit came in December the 2nd. 
in Del Carmen is it an island or is it a city or what? No, it was a small outlet, not too far. Well, I was only over there six weeks, so I didn't get to know the place too good. So, uh, but we laid out this airfield and 34th pursuit come in on December the 2nd. See, that was six days before the war. And uh, a week later, of course, when the war broke out, they, they flattened them out because MacArthur ordered all the planes to stay on the ground. Of course, Truman hadn't declared war on the Japanese, you know. So all the airplanes are on the ground as they're, they're all being on attacked ground, by the Clark Japanese. Field and, uh, mm -hmm. Stottensburg, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, B-17s come over at that time. They were going to bomb Formosa, which was ideal weather. And he ordered them on the ground. They what was in. your reaction when you heard that you could not fight back with your aircraft. How did you feel? Well, I didn't know it until after the war when, when, uh, when I heard there that MacArthur had ordered it. Mm -hmm. And then when I was at one of the conventions, one of our fellows just in a wheelchair went over to talk to him. He said he was in air warning that night and he was on duty when MacArthur ordered all the planes to stay on the ground. <laughs> I've, I've invited... Why? I've invited gentlemen. MacArthur to a convention, I guess, for five, six conventions. He, he never came. Never he came. Always I always nice gave letter. an excuse. Oh, he did. He wrote a nice letter. Yeah, he never gave. And it was in New York. Mm -hmm. We had a memorial in New York mm -hmm. for persons that died on Botanic Corregidor. Had a call, General Romulo. He was U.S. ambassador from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, MacArthur never came to these meetings? No, he never came. Uh, he he could have walked. Nice was over to the Pennsylvania um, Hotel in New York. Once the Japanese attacked, what did you do? What did you and your unit do? Well, we couldn't do much once they attacked it. I mean, there was some, uh, we just had to dodge their bombs and dodge, you know. But actually, we wind up in combat. See, in other words, I was on the front line, and we we're going to make a stand against the Japanese. And my commander sent me down to clear out their barracks at Filipinos. First barracks I went, there was a young girl nursing a newborn baby. I said, Japanese are coming. I walked out and I heard a shot. I come back into my, my outfit, and the next thing, they said, we were retreating. This was April the 9th. So, of course, I was tired, because I was an advanced guard, and I had walked all day, and I get up this line around 5 or 6 o'clock, and the next thing they say, uh, we're going back in. So the sergeant, <laughs> He was anxious to get back, and he's telling me to move that Filipino troop that was in front of us. Pretty soon, the American officer was in charge. He'd come up to me, and he wore a noise, and he said, you will blow your head off. I said, boy, that guy's nasty. But he really saved my life, because I already had discarded the machine gun. I was carrying a machine gun and a Springfield rifle. You know? So I, you, you, I dropped, so, you just got rid of the weapons? Yeah, I was so weak, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I discarded, when I got back in camp, they told me that General King had surrendered Bataan and turned in all your equipment. But all I did was turn in the Springer rifle. They didn't bother to check it too close. What happened to my machine gun? What happens when the Japanese actually take you as prisoner? What, do you recall what happened at that time and that day? Well, the next day, then we start on the Bataan death march. See, and it was, you know, 65 miles without food or water. And how did the Japanese take you as prisoner? Did you just, did they just arrive at your camp and... Oh yeah, they arrived in the camp, oh yeah. They came right into the camp, took all the military equipment, and on the next ro next day we were out on the road. Did you expect the ill, tre the bad treatment that you received from the Japanese or no? Did you expect they would be that mean towards you? Well, we didn't expect it, neither did General King, you know. He, he tried to negotiate with them to treat us decently, but they, they actually, uh, I understand they wanted to kill us all at one time there when they first captured us. Somehow they changed their mind, decided to give us a good treatment on the Bataan Death March, which they did, you know. When you lose uh, 3,000 in 10 days, it was kind of rough. And I mean, you know, a guy there next across from me, the Filipino with no legs, you know, on crutches. I mean, I, I thought I was in bad shape when I looked out across to him. I said, boy, I'm in good shape compared to that guy. And many, many times I think about him, what happened to him, but he didn't last too long. Well, and, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Then another fellow from my outfit, he couldn't get too far. And he says, carry on, man. And he dropped to the ground and the truck come over and run over him. Other fellows were bayonet if they fell down. And uh, then when I got in, of course, the first camp, I went out on detail and was mixing cement. And the fellow by name Bukowski, who were good friends, who is the other surveyor, he told me, why don't you check in for some medication? When I got, I wind up in the zero ward. And uh, I was so weak there, I had diarrhea, malaria, that I slept near the latrine, which was good in a way because what happened on these details, they just come in, grab somebody, bury them, regardless of whether they're dead or alive. I mean, because most of them were dead, but there was a few there I understand were alive. As I talked with some of the fellows who were on a burial. They actually yeah. buried people alive then? Yeah, yeah. What was your reaction to the Japanese and the other Americans' reactions to the Japanese soldiers? Well, the Japanese, of course, were really rough. I mean, of course, somebody said, well, you hate them. I never, no, I never had the hatred for them, but I didn't like what they were doing. Uh, every time in prison camp, I had a chance to double cross them, I did. What did you do? <laughs> well, working on an airfield, I had these small carts that you fill up with, uh, with uh, dirt, you know, and red shale. You run them down the track and fill it in. If I saw a pothole there, Somehow I wind up as a leader on the front car. So the rest of the cars couldn't move unless I pulled out. One day it was so hot I didn't even pull out one load. I thought for sure they would clobber me. But I got away with it. I was lucky. And so we saw a big hole there. All we'd do is put red shale over the top of it. See, these planes would come in, take a nosedive, but they never caught me. They knew I was the leader because he pulled me off the car and worked for himself. It's a fellow by the name of Connie Matsu. Mm -hmm. And every day he was pushing me. Next thing you know, he didn't find me on a job. I went back on a car. He come looking for me, because the guy replacing him was done a lousy job. Being a surveyor, you know, it was some ditch, you know, and I made it nice and smooth for him. He was very happy. So they knew you were a surveyor and they used your every, skills? Every it could have been, because yeah. he picked me out, unless he picked me out because I was, he knew I was a lead mm -hmm. guy on the yeah. job. Somehow I wind up on it. Did this Connie or Carney Matsu treat you more kindly than other Japanese? Yeah. He did, did he treat you more kindly, do you think? Yeah, I don't know if they knew. They may have known I was a surveyor. I don't mm -hmm. know whether, but somehow they picked me. Mm -hmm. You know, they had sure. Uh, sure. 10 cars. Mm -hmm. Each guy had maybe 12 people on, mm -hmm. but somehow they picked me. Mm -hmm. Because he knew that I was the one who was uh, holding up the, mm -hmm. the, the load because I had a fellow on that spoke pretty good Japanese. So he's always telling me, Katsu, Kanimatsu isn't happy. He wants us to put out more loads. I said, he hasn't said a word to me because I couldn't understand him anyway. What ever happened to this Kanimatsu? What uh, happened to him? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, the next time I was on, on another detail with him, he's lighting some dynamite. And he's not tell I couldn't see, I was blind. Five months after Batan fell, I went blind. But a fellow next to me, he says, he's, he's lighting some dynamite, we better climb a tree. <laughs> he sees me up the tree, picks up a rock to hit me, hit the other guy in the forehead. But some of the Japanese committed suicide as soon as... Uh, the Japanese soldiers committed yeah, suicide. Yeah, Talk about that, please. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Kanye suicide. Matsu, I don't know what happened to him. Mm -hmm whether he was held for war crimes or not. Um, what was, was there any other way that Americans tried to resist the Japanese without getting caught, like you were slowing up the filling in of the airfield? Yeah. Was there any other way that the men resisted? I don't know if there's any, well, I don't know what the other guys mm -hmm. done. Uh, we had one officer there that turned in one of the guys. He was out to kill him. He, when I was commander, he was out in California. Mm -hmm. He wrote me, he says, you know where Major Ferris is? I, said, I don't know, but I had a convention in Atlantic in um, San Antonio, a guy approached me. He said, you're looking for Major Ferris? I says, I met him in a bar room. He, he got broken down, a buck sergeant. So in some of the camps, he had turned in guys. But we got on the ship, and one of the Americans was, had to help loading these sardines. He was passing the sardines down to us. And Major Ferris turned him in. He got beat up pretty bad. So when he come down, he says, when, when I meet him out in California, I'll kill him. So he, 
he was looking for him. So when I was commander, he noticed, he remembered my name, he wrote to me. So I was editor of a newspaper and I put it in, but nobody uh, mm -hmm. ever replied until I got mm -hmm. it down in San Antonio at a convention. Right. And I mentioned he was broken down to a buck sergeant. Yeah. But um, most of the guys, there was one other guy that was held for mm -hmm. traitor. He was up in Maryland, but I, I forget what Why happened. do you think these several men were traitors? What, what made these men do this to other Americans? I don't know. They just catered to the Japanese, I guess. You know what I mean? They got favors from them. So that's probably, uh, you know, some of them. Well, they do it in all the wars. They had the problem. I think they had a World War II. Over in Europe, they had quite a few guys. Our, our members were stood pretty fast, most of them. The Japanese were good to doctors. We had 99 nurses come back, but the government let them all die, most of them. The they government? Did. Which our government? government? Our government. Our government. Oh, Ex yeah. Explain how they let them die. Well, they didn't treat them. Well, it, even our, you know, we didn't get any help from, the, from our government until 30 years after the war when he passed the POW bill. The only reason I'm alive today is commander. I spent two years in Washington, and these fellows are committing suicide, and they're dying. High rate of death was very high when we come back. What was that, from the sicknesses and diseases? And no, what they said, they were covered up. They said, we're nothing wrong with us. Mm -hmm. And they discharged, like the nurses, they discharged them all. They were all in bad shape. And why do you think the American government discharged everybody? Did they just want to cover up the incident? Cover up. Oh, yeah, well, they were interested in building the Japanese up. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all money. And it wasn't until 30 years later. Well, look at the Vietnam, they were even longer now. That's my war, Vietnam. Yeah, I was on, I was on Channel 4 with mm -hmm. Admiral Sumwell mm -hmm. during the Reagan administration. Defending, and he was the one that authorized the Orange, and uh, his son died from it. Agent Orange, his son died yeah. of Agent Orange. How did you get the American government to change its position? Did you talk to senators and congressmen? How did you make them change? Well, we, we fought it for quite a while and we finally got some support, you know. There was some congressmen and senators that supported us. Any from New Jersey? Any support from New Jersey congressmen and senators? Well, Senator Case was good. I didn't have any problem with Senator Case. In fact, when we were returned to the Philippines on the 25th anniversary, and I went to visit the Vietnam vets at the hospital. And I heard that no one's allowed because there's some virus. So I wrote to Senator Case. He got a clearance from the State Department. When I got in the Philippines, showed him the letter, I was able to go visit the Vietnam veterans in 1967. And of course, I was also going over there to get prescriptions, fellas that got sick but nobody else was allowed. And, uh, 